Hi, everybody. We are still in Mark chapter 4, and we're going to take up the second and third of the three parables that follow the parable of the sower in that chapter, Mark 4. Let's dive right in. Verse 26, And Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, he knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Should point out that this is another typical Markan feature showing up. I uh, should have pointed this out before we discussed the parable of the lamp and the parable of the measuring stick, which, which those two kind of go together to form one, that we have an intercalation again. That is this sandwiching kind of structure where you remember right, Jesus is using a boat as his pulpit to teach the crowds and he gives them the parable of the sower, the seed, which ends with, he who has ears, let him hear. But then we're told that sometime afterwards, when he was alone with his disciples, he then explained that parable to him, to them, as well as it told them why he teaches in parables in the first place. Well, when we get to the parables of the lamp and the soil producing fruit by itself, producing uh, a plant by itself, and after that the mustard seed. These must be parables that Jesus told, taught, back when he was on the boat. So see, see what he's done? Mark has sandwiched in between the four parables that were likely preached all together on one occasion, the explanation for the first one of them, which is a clue to us that what he has to say about the parable of the sower, in terms of what the sower represents or the seed represents, what the soils represent, that we can apply that as a key to some of the other parables that have some of the same elements and details in them, including this one. So when we see that the kingdom of God is compared to a man scattering seed on the ground, we have every reason to expect seed here to mean or refer to the same thing it referred to in the parable of the sower, which was what? The word. Jesus' word is what the seed is. That's what's being so sown. That's what's being proclaimed. But we've got some new elements that we've kind of got to figure out on our own, and here is where... Uh, scripture interpreting Scripture uh, comes comes in, and we're going to see images that, while Jesus himself doesn't come out and say, here, disciples, is what sleeping day and night means, or here is what uh, 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 ripeness of the grain means, or what putting in the sickle means, because we see some of these expressions elsewhere in the Bible, we can expect that Jesus is drawing from these other places, these parallel places, so that we can kind of decode uh, this parable. And what we end up with is the first of all the parables in which Jesus is striking a positive note, and only a positive note. This is finally encouragement and comfort for us who have heard the parable of the sower, a warning and a call to repentance of taking care to hear the word, not to turn your back on it or treat it with indifference, much less to despise it and reject it. Uh, but then also we had the business of the lamp being hidden uh, and then the, the measuring stick business where the standard by which you judge Jesus is going to be the standard by which God is going to judge you, so watch out. Now finally, having heard all of that, we get this good news that despite all that you have heard, despite the picture that may have been painted heretofore of, uh, of, of, of failure or a seeming failure, of rejection, the seed 
will accomplish the purpose for which it's planted. The word will accomplish the purpose for which God sends it out. Uh, that's what uh, this parable and the next are, are all about. So, we've got seed being scattered on the ground by a man, and here it's a man. Remember in the, the first parable it's a sower. Could the man here be Jesus himself? Maybe. Maybe. Or a preacher of the word in general. A Christian sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. That one uh, we don't have as much to go on. He sleeps and rises night and day. It, it, and isn't that interesting? It's night and day, not day and night. We have the order of a 24-hour time period as expressed in Genesis chapter 1. And the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. And so we have very much a Jewish reckoning of time here. Night then day, not day then night. But this element of a man sleeping and rising night and day, what is that a symbol of? What's that a metaphor for? I think, likely, just going about one's business. Uh, that the, the point of this, of this particular parable is that the seed uh, activates the soil in such a way that growth occurs automatically without human assistance. And so that without human assistance part is what's being conveyed or expressed by a guy sleeping and, and, and rising night and day. He, he's not actively doing anything to make the word, or the, let's stick with the elements of the story, to make the seed uh, be, be productive. And the seed sprouts and grows, he knows not how. The earth, here it's the earth, interestingly enough, in the parable of the seed, the seed is the subject so often of the verbs. Now it's, now it's the earth, and, and we, we can expect this to refer to the good earth, the good soil that was referred to in that first parable. That, and, and what would that represent? Those who believe in Jesus, those who are under the, the influence of Christ, those who are under the rule and reign of God which Jesus uniquely brings. That earth, that kind of person produces by itself. Little, uh, little Greek for you. Uh, by itself is a fine way of translating this, but the word in verse 28 is actually, listen closely, automate. Automate. What word do we get in English from this? Automatic. Automatically. So, uh, automate is literally something like uh, moving by itself. But by itself. Um, it's automatic, this, uh, this sprouting and growing that occurs. Then we have first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. I'm not going to go too far with this. I think here we might very well have a, a, an extent of correlation question. Remember we talked about how when you decode a parable, when you take all the, let's say, the surface elements of the surface story and ask, well, what are they pointing to in real life? That not every single detail in a parable is going to have a referent in real life. Some of the elements are just there so that it sounds true to life, so that it makes for a good story, a believable, plausible story. And, and this is what we might have here, that th there are commentators on this parable that want to see the blade and the ear and the full grain symbolize something quite specific in, say, the spiritual growth of a believer or the, the growth of the church as, as a whole. And this might very well just be, A, Jesus telling a story and having an element in it that, that is true to the, uh, the, the, the vehicle story of the planting of a, of a seed, but, uh, but uh, second, did, did I say first? And now I always do this. I'll, 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 I, I forget whether I'm going first, second, third, or A, B, C. If I said A, this is now B. If I said first, this is now second. My second point. 
Uh, and it is this that Jesus is saying that the growth of the word, both for the individual in terms of bearing fruit in the, in the individual, strengthening that person's faith and, and, and moving that person to act in a way consistent with the person God has made him to be, a child of God, that this happens progressively, over time, gradually. It's, it's, it's a process. It's not a, a simple uh, flipping on of a switch and uh, one day you're a reprobate heathen and, and the next day you're confronted with the good news of Jesus Christ and you become the next Mother Teresa. You know, not, not, not that Mother Teresa is necessarily the standard for uh, a, a life lived according to the Ten Commandments in one's vocation, uh, but you, you get my point that, that this is going to, to take time. And we've seen that already in the parable of the sower, that the problem with the three kinds of soil in which the word ultimately is, is, is useless, is, is not, ends up not being profitable, are, are, are instances in which the word does not have time to do its thing because the person to whom the word has come has in different ways rejected that word, refused that word. And, and so this is very consistent with that. But then finally, when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And I want to take you uh, to Joel chapter 3, verse 13, where it says, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. And the Greek translation of that passage in Joel, Joel would have originally been written in Hebrew, but the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses four words in that verse that show up exactly the same way here in the parable of the seed growing. And that is the word for putting in the sickle. You ready for this? Apostello. Apostello. Where have we heard that word before? It's the verb behind the word apostle. An apostle is one who has been apostelloed. He's been sent out with a commission. Isn't that strange? I mean, the, the language is literally send out with a commission the sickle. And, and there it is. And, and, and want to touch on the significance of that in just a second. But put in the sickle. Both those words, the word for put in, send out with a commission, and sickle are exactly the same in Joel as in here. And then uh, the word for harvest is the same. The word for ripeness is the same. Well, what's Joel talking about? The day of the Lord. Judgment day. End of the world. The day in which uh, the, 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 this world, this, uh, this age will be brought to an end and everyone will stand before the judgment throne of God. And so here is Jesus telling us that the word is going to work. The word is going to accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. And it's going to do so by its own power. That the word is, as the author of Hebrews says, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so his word, Jesus' word, which for a time and in so many cases is going to seem to be rejected, is going to seem to be having no effect whatsoever, will. It absolutely will. Trust Jesus on this. That's what this parable is, is about. And no amount of human effort is going to make that true, is going to, is going to help it along or speed up the process. No, we just have to be patient and let the word have its way and it will it will do this in such a way that this business of the harvest being ripe is a way of saying we who have had the word work in us to create faith and to bear fruit consistent with faith in Christ will be ready for the judgment we will be safe we will be protected on that day. 
uh, as, as much as judgment connotes uh, rejection, condemnation, and so forth, there is no such note uh, in, in this context that we're ready for the judgment because of the word. That, that's what this is, is, is telling us. Um, a parallel to this is in Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, we know these words well, but here, the, instead of the sowing of the seed, uh, the planting of the seed, we have, we have rain and snow, precipitation working on the ground. That, that being the image. But the point is the same. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So the, the, these two are of a piece. This Isaiah 55 and, and uh, the, the parable of the seed growing. But more than that, more than that, uh, I, I love this because it comes right after these words, which we know so well and quote so often, but do we quote them in the right context? Do we quote them in the same way that they were originally said through the prophet Isaiah? Hear this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. All right, we know this. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. How often do we hear those words applied in a situation like this? Something unfortunate has happened. Misfortune has struck someone's life. Maybe someone has died young. And, and we say, God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. This was God's will. He had some better plan that we can't understand this side of eternity. God's ways are not our ways. All right. Uh, that is not the context in which those words are originally said by Isaiah. Because when you think about it, I guess I don't want to come down too hard on people who, who speak that way. They mean well. It's, it's, it's not untrue in terms of there are some things we just don't understand. And those kinds of unfortunate circumstances are, are part of the mystery, the, 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 this life that we see things only as through a glass darkly and, and will only understand completely in heaven. But w when we put things that way, it's almost like we're, we're the good cop and God's the bad cop. It, it, it's as if, you know, if we're up to me... Uh, that person would still be alive and thriving and flourishing and, and, and live to a, a ripe old age. But God decided to, to take him early. His ways are not my ways. My ways being better. No, 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 no. Here, here is what, what Isaiah is talking about. Right before this, he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So what's, what's God just been saying about himself? He is a God who wants to pardon, who doesn't want to punish, who wants to give the wicked time to repent so that he can welcome as, as many repentant sinners into the kingdom as possible. Then he says, because God's ways aren't your ways. Because what are our ways? Our ways are, if you're unrighteous, you ought to get what's coming to you. Uh, pardon? Heck no. You should be punished. There should be consequences for, for, for your, your bad actions and for your, your conduct and so forth. But God's ways are higher than our ways. His, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. It, 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 how so? God is merciful where we are unmerciful. God pardons where we would punish. God shows uh, uh, kindness and love and compassion where, where we would show uh, anger and wrath and, 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 and mete out punishment. That's, what's, that's the context for God's ways not being our ways. 
It's just the opposite. It's when, 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 when something fortunate happens to someone who doesn't deserve it. When, when, when something good happens to someone who, who we know to be a, a, a rascal and a scoundrel, that would be an appropriate time to ring in God's ways are not our ways. That, that, that He would do such wonderful things for that terrible person, I don't know, but His ways are not my ways. And, and thank God, because each of us is that rascal, that scoundrel, that doesn't deserve any good from God, and yet He shows it to us over and over and over again. And, and so, uh, with that in mind, uh, Jesus is saying this about His Word. It's a word of forgiveness. It's a word of restoration and reconciliation with God. And that word as many times as we're going to see it rejected, will nevertheless have its way and accomplish the purpose for which it was sent by God. And it will do so all by itself because it's God's Word, and God's Word is powerful like that. But then I uh, wanted to point this out too about that judgment language which we see in the grain being ripe, putting in the sickle, the harvest has come, that Jesus himself is going to talk about the harvest coming, the judgment coming, in Mark chapter 13, where he talks about the end times. And what's interesting about this is some of that same language we find in Joel. Remember, a parallel place in Joel, in Joel chapter 2, beginning in verse 28, you get the business about the day of the Lord being a day when the sun's going to be darkened, uh, the moon will be dark. That's also a way of thinking about the day of judgment. Okay? In, um, in Mark chapter 13, where Jesus says, among other things, no one knows uh, the day or the hour, uh, so take care that, that you uh, be ready. And uh, it says here, uh, oh, I want Yeah, here it is. In those days, after that tribulation, having already talked about the destruction of Jerusalem, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory and then he'll send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. So uh, we, we have... Uh, kind of expanded some of those same elements in the parable of the seed growing. We've got uh, Judgment Day, uh, we've got End of the World, but we've also got Gathering of the Elect. See, the harvest is ripe. Now the time has come for those in whom the Word has, has accomplished its purpose and brought people to faith and life in Christ. Now they'll be gathered up by the angels from the four corners. But remember this. Not only does... Peter at Pentecost say this kind of these kinds of signs are are present at Pentecost with what 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 is Pentecost a harvest festival and what's being gathered up at Pentecost souls people are being brought to faith through the preaching of the gospel through Peter's preaching the apostles preaching on that day 3000 souls are added to the the number of saved at, at Pentecost, and 3,000 are baptized at the hearing of the Word. And, and what's applied to it? The same image that is used elsewhere in Scripture to describe the Day of Judgment at the end of time. And it's as if the, the end of time is being brought forward, being brought forward through the Word of Christ. But then most especially, it's brought forward at the cross because Jesus himself experiences those very signs that he says are signs of the end, of judgment, of last day. Remember how there, the sun, uh, the, the, there's darkness over the earth as Jesus is on the cross. There's an earthquake, a shaking, 
uh, while Jesus dies on the cross? What's happening here? It, it, it's if the day of judgment is, is, is happening. And it is. It is. And this is such a, a comforting way to think about our salvation and what it means to belong to Christ. We were all destined to face the judgment by virtue of the fact that we are God's human creatures and by virtue of the fact that we are sinners that will be held account for our sins. And yet, Jesus faced the judgment in our place ahead of time. And so now all of us who have been baptized into Christ have, as it were, already faced the judgment. And we've come through it victorious, through Christ. He faced the judgment on all sin when he died on the cross, when he gave his life as a ransom for many. And now we who have been connected to him by faith and baptism now can think of judgment as something that's already occurred in our past. It's not something that lies ahead. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Get that? See that? Uh, ah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Okay, parable of the mustard seed real quick. Verse 30, and he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when it's sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. And yet another very positive, comforting, encouraging parable from Jesus. And uh, to help with the decoding of this, a good place to go is Ezekiel chapter 17, where beginning in verse 23 you've got a lot of these same elements in terms of the tree, foliage, uh, birds making their nest in the branches. And uh, I'm, I'm running out of time here, so I won't go through the, the nitty-gritty uh, of this, but just to say that the, the birds of the air are in Ezekiel 17, a symbol for all the nations of the earth. Birds of the air represent all nations of the earth. Gentiles. Gentiles. So, so what, what's the point here? We start with something very, very seemingly small, very, very seemingly insignificant, and it grows to be this huge thing that is a refuge, is a hope, is a sanctuary, not only for the Jews, the race of the one where it all starts, Jesus, but for the whole world, for the race of humankind. That's, that's the significance of the, the birds of the air making their nest in its shade. Uh, and, and, and let's say this too, that this is yet another way of Jesus saying, don't judge a book by its cover. That, that the, the world's salvation is going to begin with this most ridiculous, in this most ridiculous, uh, uh, minuscule way, this, this carpenter's son in some backwater region of the world being crucified on a Roman cross. And yet, it is going to be at the beginning of the salvation of mankind. And what started with, with one, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth is going to grow to be the, the church. And think of the church, not only all the Christians are around the world at this very moment, but the church throughout time. All those Christians who have lived before us, who have found, uh, who have nested in the shade of the gospel, as it were, and in all the Christians who will come after us before Jesus returns in glory, that that, 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 that all started with Jesus dying on a cross.